Welcome to Every Step Podcast. I'm Christina Weston. And I'm Judith Beck. Every Step is the podcast where career and life meet. With a new guest every episode, we explore the gutsy issues affecting everyone in the workplace. Now, today we welcome Lisa Messenger. She's an entrepreneur and best-selling author, and she's also founder and editor-in-chief of The Collective Hub. Welcome, Lisa. Thank you. It's so beautiful to be here with you amazing women. (laughs) Welcome. Look, today's conversation, we're going to discuss taking risks and finding your entrepreneurial spirit. And I kind of feel like today's environment it's, it's harder to take a risk. And mainly in my views, because of the fast judgment that, you know, people dish out. I mean, when I started my businesses years ago, I didn't have social media to, to I could start the business and just move forward. And Ooh. I just wondered whether or not it's a lot harder for people to follow their dream and whether or not they um, lose the patience because they, they see what's happening on social media and they think, oh, maybe... Maybe I'm not, maybe it's not as good of a product or a widget as I thought it was because nobody's liking my post. What do you think, Lisa? Do you think it's harder these days to follow your dream? So I actually think now is the perfect time to start a business. So I started my first business 22 years ago and that was back when there weren't such things as, you know, I didn't know about mentors. I didn't know anyone else in business. It was before social media. And so I spent, I often say, 11 years over-servicing, undercharging, being everything to everyone. But I think now in 2023, even though the economy is tough and there's a lot of external factors that we need to be acutely aware of, I do think with um, the, you know, uprising of social media, it actually means that anyone can own the media and be the media and whilst, yes, there are some downsides, you know, you can see, you know, how many people have liked my post or am I good enough? And, you know, that self-doubt can creep in. I also think it affords us the most amazing opportunity in real time to get feedback. So this is where I often talk about, which is not neutral entrepreneurialism, um, you know, putting an idea out there, testing getting that real-time feedback loop, iterating and relaunching. And so I think it's exciting. I also think it's exciting because um, when the economy is tough, it means that if you actually, you know, have that little bit of extra grit or passion or tenacity, that's going to hold you in really great stead when other people are falling away or other businesses are closing down. So I think it's a super exciting time to launch a business um, as well as long as uh, people are aware of the associated risks and they set themselves up for success. I think social media is great in terms of determining product market fit. Do you think we're a little bit more impatient for success? I mean, the number of entrepreneurs and like you, Judith and I have been serial entrepreneurs for a very, very long time. And a lot of people are impatient for that overnight success. And I hear people saying, oh, I was a 10-year over overnight success or I was a five-year overnight success. <laughs> Do you think we're a little more impatient and in terms of um, the, the 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 time we're prepared to allow ourselves to grow and nurture and pivot and, and get to that point of true success? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important. I mean, it probably is hard for people when I say things like, I was an 11-year overnight success. You know, I slugged, <laughs> yeah. my guts, I slugged my guts out until really 2013, something finally worked. So I think that can be disheartening for people particularly in a society where we're all sort of instant gratification junkies. But I think if we can, you know, set smaller mile incremental milestones so that we feel like we're achieving along the way, then that's really important. I do think, like anything, social media is this duality of in one part it's really exciting because, you know, if something, if you've got a great product, if there's, you know, an existing market, if you're really great at, you know, promoting it and all of the other pieces that fall into play, then things can, you know, erupt really quickly and we can almost have a much shorter overnight success. But then the downside is, you know, we see all of this perceived success without 
always understanding you know the nuances and what has gone on behind the scenes to get to that absolutely and so then it's this false sense of well they did it really quickly why can't I so I think it is important for people to be realistic and understand I think in business there is a certain amount of you know preparedness and you know systems and processes and and understanding all of the things that go into you know from development through to distribution and marketing but there's also a small element of luck you know right time right place right influencer or content creator sharing you and then it blowing up and all of that kind of thing um so I think you know it's just important that people go into it not too naively and with their eyes wide open and they do realize that you know things don't just happen I mean I'm part you know it's spiritual woo woo go sit on a rock and um you know, call in the abundance. I'm part that and I'm also very much a commercial realist. <laughs> and so I think you've got to have a bit of the the vision and the manifesting, but you absolutely need to take action and you need to hustle your butt off really, in my experience, <laughs> to make things actually happen. That's exactly right. Well, and also to Christy and I were talking about a lot of times people are really good on the social media side, but they're not selling anything. Yeah. So, you know, they might have. And so if you compare yourself continually as a as a new business owner or somebody coming in with an idea to everybody else out there, you'll drive yourself nuts. Yeah. You're going, oh, well, I haven't gotten these likes or I haven't got this. So maybe and it does take time and you do need the patience and also um, making mistakes. That's what it's all about. Definitely. And I often talk about which is really important, I think, effort versus reward, you know, and that can be applied to any aspect of business or indeed life. (laughs) And I think what I mean by that in a social media context, um, to your point, Judith, is so many people spend so much time, I am one of them, (laughs) creating, you know, fabulous social media content and putting a lot of effort into it, but then don't see the results. And so I think it's always, I mean, I just came off a mentoring session with someone just before this, where I was saying to them, well, how much, you know, is that going to cost you in terms of time, in terms of real dollars? And what is the potential upshot? You know, what, where is that going to lead? What is the reward? And then, you know, if it's, if it's not, going to take effect then maybe we look at that investment of time and or money elsewhere and I think that goes right across the whole business and I think sometimes in business people spend the wrong time and money in the wrong places and you know if they just shift their focus a little bit or shift their thinking then that can have quite large you know an almost immediate effect my social media I do spend a lot of time on but We also monetize it in quite a number of different ways through collaborations, campaigns, um, paid ambassadorships, and all sorts of other things. So, yeah, so it it works for me. So it's really about knowing. (laughs) You got to kind of know what the what the the cutoff is as well. I mean, I remember with uh, when I had consultants working for me, I had this one consultant who every single week would come in on their their sales. uh, uh, report with the same client saying I had a meeting with this client it was like 12 months and I'm going if I see that client who has not given you one dollar on that sales thing again I go they're not going to deal with you cut it off and move on because sometimes you do have to cut your losses and you know realize that you're not going to make money out of that particular client or medium or whatever or you do a distribution wrong. strategy or customer that you're you're talking oh about so my skin was just crawling through the physical saying that because we um every every uh Tuesday at 10 a.m. I have a management meeting with my sales team and I was just went through the exact same thing you know because we run through like our hot leads and our funnel and the pipeline and you know what percentage conversion and dollar figure and and I am exactly the same when I see them reoccurring and I'm like that was dead in the water three months ago like why are they still on there so again effort versus reward like you know and we don't want to see that and it's also not uplifting for the salespeople or whoever's doing the selling which often in business is you as the founder or a CEO uh you know you need to to move on because I think 
to your point before, it's those incremental little wins, you know, that keep us going and keep us excited often in business. So we've got to set ourselves up for success and repeating the same old stuff from people who are never going to buy from you is not a road to success. <laughs> and I used to say to them, a good no, a fast no is a good no. And because yeah. when they had them on their list for a long time, they weren't closing. Yeah. And they were just, you know, thinking, oh, I'll just make this look good. I'm, I'm seeing this person and they'll eventually, and it usually would be people that would go, yeah, let's have a lunch or a cup of coffee or whatever. But they were just um, trying to get information because they were doing recruitment and they knew yeah. on the market. And, you know, and I used to say, you just have to ask them for the business. And if you, any doubt, just say, when you get your next um, job opening, are you going to give the assignment to us? Yeah, that will sort it out. <laughs> I think it's, and you know what, as you were saying that, I think so many people are fearful to actually ask for what they want, but you're absolutely right. We've got um, a big potential deal going with a, a Canadian retailer at the moment, and I had, uh, I've had two big Zoom meetings with this whole buying team and, you know, all the indicators were there and they were like, yes, you know, and we're actually talking big lots of units. I'm talking about 60,000 units here. Like that's a big dollar figure, right? So, yeah. but I've been around the trap so long. So my team who've been on those calls with me are like, this is insane. This could be like so much money. And, but you know what? They've kind of gone a bit silent. So I'm unfazed now about those kind of things. And I know when to cut it because I think in business all of us can get excited about the bright shiny things that could be and it's always kind of that you know you can pendulate between zero dollars and a million dollars quite easily <laughs> based on one person's answer and so I would much rather do which I've just done with that Canadian buyer I've just said hey can you is it a yes or a no because like if it's a no that's cool but we need to move on there's nothing worse like you say to continually have them on a weekly roster in this conversation. Oh, how are they going? It actually saps everyone's energy. I mean, of course, we all hope for a yes because yay, happy days and absolutely. You know. <laughs> it's about it's about the hard yards asking for the business, but what yeah. I also detect in this conversation is about staying in trust and being okay if it happens and okay if it doesn't. So that's a bit of that woo woo again. It's about yeah. having that 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 balance. I'm good if it happens. You know, it's great if it happens. But I'm going to be okay if it doesn't. And I yeah. think for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's that challenge when you do have no's, because there are a lot of no's before there's that, that good yes. It's yeah, there are. understanding when you get up and how to get up and, and how to knock on that next door and find a different way of accessing that customer. So I think it's also getting harder to access customers because we're not taking phone calls from numbers that we don't recognise. You know, mm. social media, we kind of either see it or we ignore it. A lot of people ignore LinkedIn. You know, there's, there's, we have to find new and creative ways of accessing our customers. We do. And to your point, we just need to not kid ourselves and we need to um, detach from being too attached to a specific person and broaden the funnel. You know, if I always say if we have, you know, 20 or 100 different irons in the fire as opposed to three where we're like, oh, they might, they might, they might. <laughs> I'd much rather have, you know, a lot more so that you're not setting yourself up for disappointment. And, and this is probably a learned thing over years and years and years of hearing a lot of no's. And I certainly noticed this with some of my, <clears throat> not even younger, younger in terms of business team who haven't been around the traps as much, you know, you get, because there are all these kind of false buying signals. So sometimes people will be like, and they've got their own agendas going on or their own whatever it is. So they want to try and people please. So you get excited. And I notice a lot with the team that haven't been around the selling cycle so much, they will say, wow, this looks like it's going to come off. And, you know, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. And so I think over the years I've learned to not get excited until the money's in the bank. <laughs> and to your point around um, reaching buyers, absolutely, it can be trickier. And so a few things on that, which I always talk about, is <clears throat> recognise what your own particular strengths are. So, for example, <clears throat> pardon me, we have a pretty high following and a highly engaged following on social media. So Collective Hub has, I think, 192,000 followers or something. I've got 162,000 or something when we're at the time of recording this. 
So I know that if I reach out um, through Instagram to people, more often than not, if it's short, sharp, succinct and telling them what's in it for them, they'll generally reply because it's almost like my Instagram num numbers give us that credibility. Now, if people don't have that, then I say, well, lean on something else that's credible to, you know, find a way to open the door. I'm still a big um, advocate of old school snail mail because I think so few people actually take the time now to write a note. So often I'll say, you know, if someone's been in the media or they've had some kind of win, well, take the time to write them a little handwritten note, pop it in the mail because, you know, as you say, when there's so much noise in our inboxes and every other platform, sometimes that, you know, gets people's attention. Um, there's a lot of different ways, but I think, again, effort versus reward, lean into whatever is your strongest point and, and use that to kind of open the door. Absolutely. I, I, I'm a big um, proponent of being in front of people as much as I possibly can if I'm trying to develop business with them. It's not always possible to do that. So, and I think in today's environment, we've all had to try to find different ways to, to be seen and be heard and also build that level of trust and, and that relationship with people. And that, that must be really hard for new business owners as well, trying to do that because, you know, they can't, you know, for several years, we haven't been able to just say, let's just catch up or can I come to your office or, and how, how are you finding that? Have you, what have you seen there? So I, yeah, it's not funny. I often think about this. I mean, the time we used to take, you'd, first of all, you'd have to be in the same physical city or town as the people you'd then go in an uber or however you got their drive for an hour to get to the meeting you'd have a meeting for an hour and you'd come back it would be like a three hour out of your day and you know I feel like I mean I wrote a book in 2018 pre-pandemic called work from wherever and after 17 years bricks and mortar office um, I decided to decentralize my team. So I've been doing this for quite a long time. So I now have, I mean, I'm in Bangalore near Byron Bay. My brand manager's in Sydney. My head of logistics and operations is in Melbourne. Um, my head designers are, one of them's in um, Canada, one of them's in France. Like we literally, my um, my CFO is the chief finance officer, Kate. She's been with me about 14 years. She owns a um, a rescue animal sanctuary outside of the Blue Mountains, so nearly three hours from Sydney. Like, we are everywhere. So I've become very used to this way of working. Um, but for new businesses, yeah, it's tricky. And, again, I always say lean into what your strengths are and what your credibility is in order to get that meeting and also work out who the gatekeepers are. You know, oftentimes they may be, a PA or, you know, whoever it happens to be and find a way to recognise and acknowledge them and make friends with them. Um, you know, often social settings, if you can get out and about are a great way. I know for sure if I, you know, meet someone at a dinner party or meet someone, you know, out and about, they're more often likely to take your phone call if you've had some kind of connection or if it's some sort of third-party endorsement, you know, this person said to me, here, do this, or whatever it happens to be, then that's a way around it. Um, and I know for sure that I've done this several times. So back in 2013 when I launched my magazine, Collective Hub, as a print magazine, people said print was either dead or dying. They said, you know, I had absolutely zero credibility. Um, you know, everything was stacked against me. And I had to go out and try and pre-sell, you know, advertising um, in a highly saturated market that people said was dead or dying with no credibility whatsoever. But I did it because I really lent into, okay, well, what do I have to call on? And really in that case, um, I was very much in start an unknown startup phase. But what I could call on, which every new business owner or entrepreneur have in spades, is the passion and the vision for what is going to be. And that's where you've got to be able to paint that picture very quickly in an elevator pitch and, and get other people to buy into it. And, I mean, you ladies have come from corporate. What I always say is, you know, there's so many people out there who really 
don't enjoy their jobs, you know, they're just looking for a little bit of spark and someone else's enthusiasm. So if you as a startup can impart that in some way, then more often than not, you know, you can get that meeting, that first meeting and get someone to buy into your belief. So I think don't underestimate that that passion and that that startup mentality that so many of us lose when we get, you know, when our businesses become big and global and it becomes about inventory and logistics and operations and systems and processes. <laughs> it's, it's definitely about the definitely about the passion. The passion definitely shines through and and it's also, as you've been pointing out, the storytelling. It's, mm. it's what's what's your story? And it's not just the facts and figures, it's it's about what's the emotion around your story? What is what are you invoking? What are you promising me? What am I going to get if I buy this service, yeah. this product, this widget? How is it going to make me feel and and really put it in another in another language for people so that they can feel into it rather than just analyze I it? I love that you said that. And Danielle Laporte does this so well, and I've talked a lot about it over the years. It's the feeling. It's funny, when I owned the magazine and we did 54 issues, which was in 37 countries over five years, um, so many people would pitch to me. And it was always about, you know, we were all wearing glasses, so I'll use that as an example. <laughs> it would be someone saying, um, hey, we've got these great glasses and, you know, they're done in this shade of blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, forget it. Let's just agree the glasses are great. Now, tell me your story. Like, why do you exist? What's your supply chain? What's your purpose for being? And I think this is really important because once you start getting into that, boom, you're hooked. You know, it's nothing more boring than someone just trying to sell at you. But as soon as they tell you the story and their reason for being and how they're going to help, you know, the recipient of this conversation, then we all light up and we all buy into that and we all get excited. So, and I can say having been pitched to, you know, over and I mean, a hundred times a day, every day for that five years, the people who stood out were the ones who really, as you said, told the story. And I just, I was like, oh, let's grab a cuppa. Let me yeah. sell this for this. I'm in love with your brand. <laughs> and it's in an authentic way. You can't manufacture that. It can't just be a spiel. It has to be from yes. a, a deeply authentic place. And I know that's a very overused phrase. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It's about part of your essence has to be in it if, if you're the lead entrepreneur or one of the founders or co-founders. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And also that true authenticity because I think in these days you know a lot of people are trying to kind of fake authenticity but I think in that true form of authenticity be unafraid to take people on the journey don't just um pr you know show them the bright shiny object at the end like actually say well I went through this and this happened and I kind of failed a few times but here I mean people love that and I think they fall in love with you and your brand even more because it's real and it's relatable I often use those words like real raw relatable attainable I think they're really important yeah. I often come across people who um are afraid to lean into their failures um, I know I've had a number of failures and I think if you haven't had a failure, you haven't been an entrepreneur, you haven't been trying. <laughs> but my sense is there are people that are ashamed of their failures and and they don't want to talk about what went wrong on the journey or where they perhaps did a, had a misstep. Yeah. I mean, I think absolutely embrace failure make failure a friend I mean I really believe one of the greatest traits of an entrepreneur is that we are problem solvers and you know we just have we don't like I would say I have no particular skill set I'm not particularly great at anything what I'm great at is problem solving and asking the right questions and so I think you know if you're not failing often then you're not trying hard enough because that's the only way. I mean, I honestly, I fail in some way every single day, like literally every single day because every day I'm trying to push the envelope a bit. But uh, it's just, you know, fail often, fail fast <laughs> is important. You know, don't make these humongous failures. And I think, again, coming back to social media, this is where it is, useful because we can put something out there in real time get real time 
feedback rather than you know going to market with a product or a service and kind of waiting for the market to respond and then realizing oh my gosh I spent you know all of these months or years creating this big thing and actually there's not a market like I think we can really test and iterate quite quickly now yeah absolutely and I think I think always have the philosophy of there's um my husband and I have the saying: "There's a, there's always a bigger boat." Like there's if you if you're if you're worried about someone else is going to be doing it bigger and better than you all the time. <laughs> well, there's always going to be someone doing it better, and yes. instead of worrying about it, learn from it. And it's kind of like we were saying about our mistakes. If you don't learn from those mistakes, you've just wasted a good mistake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's it. It's just about reframing it. And you're absolutely right. I mean, there would be a million and one reasons not to start a business <laughs> because you could always say, well, that's already been done. You know, that person's already done that. But I mean, I love a highly saturated market. It means there's an audience. You just got to bring your own unique take to it and, you know, off you go. And if people start copying you, well, A, you're doing something right, but also move faster, you know, keep changing your offering all the time. Keep it fresh, keep evolving. So how much time do you give a new idea if you're launching a new idea or a new product? I mean, you've got the benefit of having a big audience and you can validate things and some people will validate you because they just love you to bits and they're going to say yes because it's you. How much time do you give a new idea or a new concept? Uh, it depends. So, I mean, it depends what kind of an idea. So I'll give you an example. So at the moment we put out about 40 to 60 books, affirmation cards, journals, and dated products a year. So to develop those, I mean, I just, but I'm a little bit unique here. I know because people say all the time, how do you come up with all of those? So I ideate every single one of those, uh, those products. So, but it, that's quite quick for me now because I, the how I do that is I'm constantly open so I'll listen to podcasts in genres that I wouldn't normally listen to or I'll go to a town I haven't been to and I'll go into a store and I kind of see what I call jump points everywhere like little you know little snippets of oh I could turn that into something or that could da -da -da -da. so so that for me is quite quick now but I have a number of other businesses that I either invest in or start on the side. So if it's something that I don't have systems and processes around already, then I'll probably spend a lot longer trying to understand the market, understand, you know, what else is out there. So that's that's a lot longer. So let me just break that down a little bit. So when I'm producing, um, let's call it printed product, I know the process. I come up with the idea. Um, I either write it myself or I have a writer. Then I have, you know, an editor, a proofreader, a fact checker, a sub-editor, a designer. I go to print. I have a landed product, customs clearance, distribution to our, you know, USA, Australia, New Zealand. Oh, like sounds easy, but it's like quite, it's very, very systemized now. Um but if I'm coming up with like a completely different thing that we've not done before, then I'll probably spend, you know, more time kind of going through all of the things that I mentioned before to understand. For example, last year I lived in the US for pretty much all of the year. I was back and forwards, I came back to Australia, I think four times, but I spent time living in Austin and then I spent time living in LA. And Whilst that wasn't around new product development, it was around new market. And the reason I went over there is I'd had about probably 13 years of false attempts, little mini failures at really getting very solid distribution in the US. And I realized that in order to do that, I needed to go and spend some very conscious and purposeful time living there to understand the nuances of you know the buying patterns the um the audience like social media content creators and influencers very different to how we do it in Australia I wanted to understand sampling I wanted to understand events I wanted to go and spend time in stores and understand what products sell in the US and why quite different to what we sell in Australia so 
that I really invested some quite serious time and money, you know, and a country move to do it. <laughs> so it really depends on, but what I would also say around that is for anyone, do not write 200 page laborious business plans, you know, and cross every T and dot every I only to get to market and be like, oh, well, the market's not there anymore. I've spent all my time and money and I'm completely exhausted. Like I'm very much around small incremental, so minimum order quantities or minimal viable product, you know, beta testing the market, however you want to say it, so that you can change, pivot, morph, iterate as the market demands it. So, yes. Yeah, exactly. I hear this as well. Definitely. Start as a lean canvas and get out there and yeah, test it. Exactly. Great, Eric Rise. Great. Um, yes, there's some great books out there about like just how to do, go to market quickly. I think it's really important. I think and being I think in market is really critical. What you've just described. I think it really is important if you've got an international business or you're seeking. You actually have to be there. You have to be on the ground because there are cultural nuances. I've lived in Mexico and other parts of the world and you're trying to sell to people. It's very different in those markets and you can't just sit here in Oz no, and, assume, and assume you know how other markets work. It, it's very important it. to be there. And, I mean, we could do a podcast for three days on all my failures trying to get into the US, but literally within eight months of being there, we're now stocked in 40 states, in physical stores in 40 states. Wow. We're in some of the biggest, um, you know, independent and chain stores in the US. We've now got a regular slot on Good Morning America. Like, But it really took me being there to really understand. Um, we do eight trade fairs a year in the US now. So I really had to be there to understand it because honestly I could spend days and days and days telling you how many false attempts and how <laughs> badly I did it until I took the time to get my house on a plane and go and really live amongst people and understand. Mm. And those two markets were quite different. I mean, California and Texas. Yeah. That's night and day. <laughs> it's like, Absolute no, night. Different markets. Absolute night and day. And now we do. Um, so now I have 15 sales reps on the ground in the US and we do trade fairs in Atlanta, Vegas, LA and New York. Um, and so now we're covering a lot of the US. Yes. And Austin was very, very different to <laughs> LA, but really important to spend time in different areas. And really, I mean, and then you would know Austin outside of Austin um, within Texas, you know, I spent time in Dallas and Fort Worth and like like very different again. <laughs> I worked in I worked in banking in Dallas, and there's people in Texas who have never gone out of Texas and never want to. And yes. <laughs> so it's kind of you know it's a whole different ball game. And then obviously yeah. California is quite different too. So yeah. that's quite interesting. I mean, that would have been quite challenging. Just sort of deciding, you know, I guess you would have to get a lot of people sort of on board who would kind of give you some advice and feedback as well on the on the nuances yeah and the big thing about that so um my hubby and I were over at the, there at the same time and he has a hospitality tech business and in Australia he's pretty well known I'm relatively well known what's fascinating about it is when we got there you know it is like leave your ego at the door and you've got to go in and be really humble you know because uh <laughs> I remember in Austin I went to uh, a gift store you know because I was like here I just wouldn't have meetings with anyone anymore I don't need to but there I was like I just want to come and meet with these people so just trying to get them to agree to have a meeting coming back to what we were saying before they're like who are you you know <laughs> oh well I've written 36 books and you know you try and like leave your ego completely at the door and I got to this meeting after she finally agreed to and I was sitting on this tiny chair and she was like so many heads above me and here I am trying to excuse like well who are you and like you know the fact that I've shared a stage with Richard Branson five times or you know Anna Winters flown me to New York like I've done a lot right but still I'm there like selling my soul to try and you know and I think this is really important about being able to be humble and go into new markets or new products with a beginner's mind and start again. And the beautiful thing about that is it's actually amazing when you've had some success and no one knows or cares who you are, as I found when I went to the US, because what happened was 
I'd gotten a bit complacent and a bit like ho hum about my business. And I was like, this is gritty. This is this startup phase again. This is exciting, you know? So I actually really enjoyed being a nobody because I had to get that grit and prove myself again and prove that we were worthwhile. And, you know, eight months later, 40 states. So, you know, I've, I've been in the startup trenches in many ways over the years. <laughs> That's a really good message because. We were um, we were having a conversation with Andrew Griffin, who's who's written a lot of a lot of books. And one thing that that he was saying was that you, you got to keep your hustle up all the time. Like even yeah. though you you know written a lot of books and they've been bestsellers and stuff, there's a new one, there's a new one, there's a new one, and you yeah. have to continually not be complacent, which is what you know Christina and I have always talked about with our businesses as well over the years that every day is a new day. It's a new challenge and you can lose it like that. If you don't, you know, you you can be here today, gone tomorrow. And so you, you're only as good. Like I used to say in recruitment, you're only as good as your last placement. And if if one of your consultants or someone bombs, bombs out and does something wrong, that's what people remember. (laughs) So there's, you know, that old adage, God forbid, let's touch some wood, but, you know, 20 years to build a career, 20 minutes to tear it down, you know, it is. And particularly now, cancel culture, like, Uh, you know, everything that's going on, you mean, yeah, it's, you got to keep your wits about you and you got to stay relevant, you know, really, you do these days. Yeah. yeah, I think we're at a we're at a good point to start some some wrap up conversations and bullet points. So maybe with the benefit of all our experience having been in entrepreneurship and with the benefit of a few years under our belts, what would you tell your younger self if you were embarking you were embarking on your first entrepreneurial virt- venture? What would be your advice to your younger self with the the benefit of of all your wisdom now? Lisa. Thank you. I think um, definitely believe in yourself. Like I think really for me, everything starts with mindset. So I would say if there are ways that you're not feeling confident or you're not feeling good enough, then be unafraid to, you know, seek some help and support around that so that you understand what could be holding you back or how you could be self-sabotaging so yeah self-belief I think is really important and the second thing would be have a real sense of purpose and why Uh, I think that's really important so many people go into business just thinking oh I just do this because they don't really have that I think you've got to really believe in what it is that you're wanting to create and I often say then the synchronicity and the serendipity and it just has a way the how has a way of taking care of itself so purpose then I think the third thing would be you don't have to do it alone so surround yourself with a team and I wrote a whole book called money and mindfulness which is very much around more currencies than cash. And I think so many people when they're starting out think, oh, but I can't afford to pay someone to build my website or, you know, do whatever part of the business is. But I really believe uh, that, there's, and I mentor so many people, you know, it's what are your skill sets won't be someone else's. So find ways to exchange skill sets. You know, someone could build your website and you could help them write some copy or you know all we have skill sets that we can exchange so I think don't feel like you know you have to do it yourself is probably number three um number four I would say definitely understand your numbers I think too many people start businesses as creatives and think oh this is just fun and the passion's going to get me along which to a degree is okay when you're small but as you scale if you don't if you're not intimate with your finances, things can head south very quickly. <laughs> um, number five, fail fast. I could go on. Anyway, that's <laughs> Judith, number six. <laughs> number six. Well, I love all those, but the um, I think um, one of the things I would always say to people who are starting business um, is don't spend it before you earn it mm-hmm. and don't spend it on things that are unnecessary. Don't, don't buy your business. People buy mm-hmm. your business. Uh, because of you and your product don't think that you have to whine and dine and take people out and do all this stuff before they've given you any business so that that money side is very important 
the the passion and the purpose uh, definitely is there. And I think the other thing is, and Lisa, you probably have heard this before from Richard Branson, is surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. So you are the ideas person. You're the person who brings the product and everything. But get those smart people in <laughs> smarter than you because they're going to help you and they're going to make you shine. Yeah. Uh, and that's and also people who um, buy into your vision. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, well, that, those are hard to beat. I'd probably add um, stay curious and keep a learning mindset. You're, you'll learn till you'll Till you die, if you yeah. keep, if you keep that mindset happening, and that's critical to staying relevant and to understanding your customers and what your customers need. I love that as well. Powerful. <laughs> love that, ladies. Lisa, we absolutely loved having you spend time with us. I think we could keep chatting forever and ever and ever. I think we, we could come up with a list of 100 rather than just whatever we did, 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever it was. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, ladies. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. For more information about Every Step and our guests, head to everysteppodcast.com. To be notified of new podcasts, please subscribe via your favourite listening platform. And of course, follow us on social media and direct message us to share your ideas about guests or topics.